So welcome to the Firefish Software Future of Rec Blab. I'm your host, Cameron McLennan. Join me today is my co-host, Alan Hiddleston. Hi, everyone. And we've also got Alex Moyle with us today. Alex, thanks for joining us. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Alex, can you start and um, kick this off by just telling everyone a little bit about yourself? So my name is Alex Moyle. I'm a, a recruitment trainer and a business development trainer that's been in the recruitment industry for 18 years. Uh, unusually, I sort of believe that recruitment and relationships go hand in hand. And so I sort of work, work to spread the message that candidates, uh, a relationship with a candidate is for life, not just for the vacancy. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully to slowly but surely improve the perception that the world has of recruiters from, from being someone that should be on a register the day they sign up to, uh, to someone that's a valued member of society. Brilliant. Alex, you adopt a blended approach when it comes to relationships, both digital and face-to-face. -face. Um, what do you put the biggest emphasis on and why? Well, I mean, I'm, I think that the emphasis will always be on, on, on the face-to-face -face relationship. I think uh, one of the unique things about recruitment is it is a, a people business. And uh, to a large extent, it's, it, it's really about how do you find good people and put those people together. And my first manager always said that you never know the nature of the beast until you look the beast in the eyes. Yeah. Uh, and so the more you can believe in a physical relationship, uh, the more you can add value to your clients uh, and differentiate yourself. And it's not to say there's there's not a role for recruiters that are purely digital or or phone based. But but for me, recruitment will always be a people business. And and I think it's how do you how do you, you can help people better when you know them as an individual, because ultimately people are more than a job spec and they're more than a CV. Yeah. That Alex, I mean that. You know, I agree. Agree with you know a lot of what you're saying there, but I think, I mean, is it really like, is it actually still financially viable to to sort of see, you know, everyone face to face? I mean, especially in the market today, where we got a situation where, you know, people are not just like across the road. You know, people are we're, we're recruiting. It's it's a global, you know, economy for talent. Um, I mean. Is face to face still still viable? Like, and in, in terms of that's your your main relationship channel. Yeah, I mean, I th it's not the only relationship channel. I think it's. I, I think vi viability also goes with are people willing to pay for it? And and I think increasingly it is possible to deliver a recruitment service that that's just done over email or or over phone conversations. And 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 for me, the reason I think face to face is so important is because I think it's the last thing that you can use to justify why you're worth that little bit more. You know, and, and so I think it's you, you can deliver a recruitment service without ever speaking to anyone. You can deliver a recruitment service on the phone. I've got a client uh, in the Ukraine uh, and they recruit day, day in, day out into Germany, you mm. know, and they do a great job with that. And, and they have some really loyal clients. And, it, and but but you know what? They find they get more commitment from their clients when they make a trip to Germany and meet the people that they recruit for day to day. Cool. And so I think it's I think it's what what's changed is that. In the past, face-to-face -face needed to be earlier in the process to convince people to use you, where now I think you can build more credibility and influence through some of the digital channels, through blogging, through blabs and, and other sorts of content marketing. You sort of get to show people, this is who I am and this is what I believe in. Yeah. And I think, I think for recruiters, I think that's really important. And I'm not sure enough recruiters put enough time into letting people know they're a real human being, uh, as opposed to just this sort of like data shifting machine. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I would agree with that. I mean, we, we certainly notice that people in this day and age are a lot further through the buying process when it comes to things like software than they, than uh, before they choose to speak to another human being. So I think the shifts there, definitely. Yeah, and, and I think Dan Pink talks about in his sort of to sell as human talks about how the sales process has evolved in the sense of by the time someone speaks to you now, they probably already know about you, they know about your competitors, and they probably know quite a lot about pricing. Yeah. And yeah. so... The physical uh, contact is really about solidifying that last 5% that, that gives you the edge over everybody else. Yeah. Uh, in recruitment, it's really about whose CVs does the client open up first? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. when, 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 when someone says over email, trust me, uh, will they trust the person over email or will they trust the person that they've met and looked in the eyes? Yeah. You know, so it, a lot of it depends on whether you want to be a transactional recruiter or whether you want to be a, a consultative recruiter. Mm. And there's space, there's space for both. It's just that if you want to be able to work to charge a premium or, mm. or have that level of influence with a client, it's the face-to-face -face is, is important. 
where would you start when building a relationship then, uh, Alex, like digital or analog? And do you think there's a specific to industry? Uh, I mean, I think the, the 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 place you always start when you're trying to sell something is is think about what your what the needs of your customer are. And I think mm -hmm. in the digital world that has changed as well. Uh, increasingly, when when back in the day when I started in recruitment, the focus was all about what challenges the client had within their team. Uh, but increasingly, the focus is actually on understanding the mindset of a line manager. And, and as I travel and spend time with companies, it's it, it never ceases to amaze me how many recruiters have actually never thought about what's going on in the mind of a line manager, what challenges they have when that skill set goes unfilled, uh, the pressures they've got to recruit right the first time, uh, and the consequences they have to their own career if they don't get it right. Uh, and, and because no one asks about that, a lot of recruiters miss probably half the things that they have to promote their service against because actually people will want to meet you face to face or will want to do things differently if they can get a personal gain mm. uh, where too many recruiters just focus on the candidate. But the problem is everyone's got candidates. Cool. Okay. Okay. So I, I think like following on from that, then we, we were, we we're actually going to kind of talk about the pros and cons of, of, you know, can, you know, can you build effective sort of relationships, um, you know, online and offline. And I think you're already saying, yeah, the answer is yes there. Um, but I think that one of the, you know, one of the key things is, I think what you're saying is like, let's pick our slot and then let's build some credibility online and then let's jump in to cement the relationship when we get a bit further down the line and, and let's do that in a scenario where it can be, you know, where that's included in our cost model, that kind of high touch method if we've if we've got that. Yeah. Um, but I think like one of the things that kind of like fascinates fascinates us and it's a real hot topic in terms of like business development now is, you know, can you actually build trust with people online? Like another person at the other end of a computer, at the other end of 140 characters on Twitter. I mean, can is that doable? Like, I mean, is that realistic? Uh, I think a lot of it depends on how you how you sort of define trust. And I guess I see trust as proving to someone that you care about them getting what they need equally to you getting what you want as well mm -hmm. and and so i think you can do that uh through 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 social media and other digital channels so for instance uh you might uh do a blog which is which highlights the pros and cons of bullhorn you know and the bond adapt and you might highlight the pros and cons of firefish because you know there's different pros and cons and by doing that you're showing yourself to be pragmatic about people choosing the right product for them uh that that is a great way to show about trust uh, I write blogs on why people should do a lot of their own new consultant training themselves because I believe that's the right thing to do. If someone said, Alex, I don't want to bring someone in to do this, but how would you do it? I'd probably give them the advice on that because I want them to develop their people irrespective of whether they they, they give they give me that business. And I think a lot of what, what a lot of content marketing does is is allow businesses the opportunity to give more away of what they do to build to build that trust. And and increasingly the where where you can see modern businesses and, and old fashioned businesses is old fashioned businesses keep their knowledge to themselves because they go, you've got to pay me to access this. Mm -hmm. uh, where modern businesses go, look, here's the knowledge. Uh, when you struggle to do it, I can help you how to do it. And, and a guy that talks about this a lot is Dave Hazelhurst, where yeah. he, gives, he gives a lot of his stuff away and he talks about that. But what he says is when you find it difficult, because it is difficult, then you can call me and I'll be able to help you out. Uh, and I think that's how the the process has changed. And, and in some ways it's mm -hmm. the re relevance to the recruitment industry is often too many recruiters think it's all about my candidates. It's all about my candidates where actually everyone can get candidates. I think Greg at your conference spoke about, it's not about having candidates. It's about being able to bring them to the table and mm -hmm. get them to turn up on day one. And so the role of a recruiter now is, is, is not, is that there's like a commodity price for being able to find a candidate and arrange an interview process, but it's about how do you help the process? Mm -hmm. How do you help a company support their employer brand? How do you support that candidate through the contract to, for them to feel mm -hmm. that they're supported and you earn your margin every day? Yeah. Uh, the, the recruiters that struggle are the ones that want a quick buck, which is get a job spec, look on a job board, screen some response and send it across. Yeah. And so and that, that there's difficult, the world of making quick fees is not going to be around for much longer. Mm. I, I think like... Uh, 
and that that's an interesting point, Alex. And I think just on that point, I mean, what what we see is like there. If we just think about like people promoting themselves online, what we see, you know, quite often is it's quite easy to make yourself look good online. You know, as well, it's easy to kind of fake that. Um, or or am I being cynical about that? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, is that content marketing has become so mainstream now. It's trying to differentiate between the content that's produced by a PR company and then posted on behalf of the CEO uh, and, and content that's produced by the individual. Uh, and it's content that serves their customer rather than serves themselves. And I think uh, Mark, Mark Hopkins on the stream talks about sort of demonstrating capability. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and a lot of recruit, I think it is about the testimonials, as, as he says, and recommendations and reputation, but it's how do you, how does a recruiter do that, but not give away what they do? Uh, and, and so that's where I think a recruiter is, is, is not just about the blogs they write. It's, I think actually recruiters could do more video. They could do more labs. I know a couple of recruiters now that do uh, video job specs or job adverts that yeah. sort of, and they do that with the client as well. And so they'll be in a meeting and go like, tell me why this is a great job. And they'll go, this is what we're recruiting for. So give us a shout. And, and I think, where, where recruitment becomes fun for me is where you feel like you're working with a human being and, and another human's helping you. Yeah. Uh, and where, where, where I think, was it Bill said that if, you, if you, what you do uh, feels like it could be done by a robot, then it probably will be. And that's, and that's, that's what we're trying to, trying to fight against, really. So how do you create a relationship for yourself um, where clients defer to your knowledge then? I think, uh, I think you've got to think of yourself a bit like a, a doctor. In, in whatever you do. So what a great doctor does is, is, actually, uh, is actually focus on what the other person's situation and need is first. Mm -hmm. And then they don't tell them what to do, they just offer guidance. And so it's, it's more like, have you thought about doing this or have you thought about doing that? Or in my experience, this could work, but what are your thoughts? Uh, if, you, if you think you're the, the Messiah and you go, this is the way, uh, yeah. I have the way, uh, then, 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 sort of people are more skeptical, and because people don't want to believe that. But if you go, well, you could do this. What do you think? Yeah. And the more sort of laid back you are about promoting ideas and suggestions, the more open people are. And yeah. So, sorry, sorry. I was, I was just going to say, it, and, and the, the best people I know as recruiters never call a client and say, "I've got the perfect candidate," because that gets the clients back up. They want to sit there and think, "Right, I'm going to work out why you're wrong." They just go. I've got someone that you might want to look at. I'm not sure whether they're perfect, but tell me what you think. Yeah. And, and it's, it's much more understanding that the client's the decision maker. Yeah. So what you're saying is it's, it's about guiding, guiding people towards making an informed choice themselves mm -hmm. rather than. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm an, I'm a, I, I always joke with, 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 uh, with my friends. I, I, they always say you're a salesman. I go, I'm a dreadful salesman, uh, but I'm a really good assistant buyer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and the difference is very subtle, is that a salesperson's trying to make someone do things and they're trying to force a decision where an assistant buyer is, is on the same side of the table. And so when my, the, the example I often use is when my wife goes shopping on her own, I'm not really that worried because I know it's her versus the salespeople and she's skeptical enough that it won't cost me too much. But when she goes shopping with her friends, I'm, I'm going to be a ruined man because, <laughs> because her friends aren't friends. They're assistant buyers. They're going oh, you know this situation, or you know you said this the other day, or you know you're trying to do this, well, what about this, what about that? Yeah. And, and that's what we've got to be, is we've got to be the friend as the assistant buyer rather than, and, and that, in that sense, what we do is, as, as recruiters is also position ourselves where we can begin to partner with HR functions and internal recruitment teams. Mm -hmm. uh, too many recruiters still think they're the only game in town, and so all they want to do is bust a process open, and, and whilst there's a place for that, uh, I know plenty that are succeeding now by being the fallback, by being the contingency. And, and historically, contingency was uh, about my fee is contingent upon me making a placement, where now contingency means that when your process fails, I can help you out. Uh, and my, 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 my first director said, Alex, when, when, when a client says they've got a PSL or they've got someone that they use, ask them whether they've got a spare tire in their car. And I go, oh, why, why don't I do that? He says, well, tell them that if they get a puncture through the process, you can be there to make sure they get to where they need to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that, that was how I was always trained to approach business development right from the word go. You're the, you're the contingent option uh, when what they do at the moment doesn't, doesn't work out. That's an interesting approach, Alex, because I think sometimes people focus too much on having relationships with clients only when they have a need. 
Like it's all about the here and now. This client has a job on, so I'm going to nurture and maintain that relationship and keep it there. As soon as the jobs disappear, the relationship's forgotten about. Um, do you not think it's better to nurture those relationships, like you're saying, for the long term so that you become the go-to person? Absolutely. Uh, and mo many people here will be familiar with the term audit and advisory, which is the term the big four use when they within their services. And so audit is the technical discipline that they provide. Mm -hmm. advisory is the services that they offer over and above that and so outside of the audit the partner will keep in touch with the cfo and they'll just go how are you doing with this regulatory change they yeah. don't ring up and go by the way don't use your internal finance team use me instead mm -hmm. uh, like they ring up and they just go if you have a problem with this give me a shout yeah uh, and 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 they nurture that and also that the cfo recognizes that the audit partners got got value to add uh yeah. whether it's around risk risk management legislation uh just like uh, recruiters have val should have value to add. And, mm -hmm. and most recruiters think what they exist in is their own little silo, where actually they exist as part of a much wider, broader HR community around retaining, attraction, developing of staff. And so the best recruiters are able to advise companies on how to retain staff, how to improve their own recruitment process, should be able to have a conversation about employer branding and how to maintain reputation in the, in the market. And if they can do that, they then become the person that people go to for advice uh, yeah. as well as vacancies. And I, one, one of the things I was, I was taught really early on in my career is that you know you're going to get a job from a client the day they ring you for a bit of advice uh, yeah. because that's when they see you more than just a CV machine. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. that. That's really good, Alex. I think there's a key point in there that, um, you know, was really kind of ringing true with me. But, but it's almost like you're suggesting like approach sales from the perspective of like, I'm going to have a conversation with you because you're in the market to, to, to buy something, whether or not that's my services or anybody else's services. One of the outcomes is that you might end up buying services from me, but my primary objective here is just to help you to try and understand like what you should do. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. And, and I think that works, uh, works well. And a lot of it depends on the, on the, on the sales cycle. So in recruitment, mm -hmm. the sales cycle is pretty short because people probably hire mm -hmm. two, three, four times a year mm -hmm. in the nature of CRM uh, stuff. You need to automate more of that relationship because it could be three, four, five years that you have a relationship before they think about changing or being ready to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're still thinking about that is someone that I want a relationship with. What am I doing to add value to that relationship? Uh, uh at what time then, Alex, do you make a decision to exit a relationship? I don't think it's I don't think it's about exiting a relationship. I think it's about managing the amount of, amount of effort that you put in. And so, but for me, relationships, the good relationships are always built on a quality. And when you feel you're working disproportionately harder to the other person to make it work, then then it's time to to, to lessen the input. You know, yeah. and they go they go on the back burner. And the key for a successful business development culture is that you never become beholden on someone having to buy. Mm -hmm. and, and and great recruiters have enough business going on that no one deal will make or break their year. Uh, and I, I'm always I, I always see there's a direct correlation between unlucky recruiters and the ones that only had one deal going on that had to come mm -hmm. off in order for them to make their money. Yeah. Uh, and so unlucky the the. The most unlucky recruiters I meet are the ones that are generally the most successful because they can afford to have three or four things not come off a month yeah. uh, and still hit their target and sma or smash their target. Yeah. And so a bad month becomes hitting target. A great month becomes smashing it. Yeah. Uh, so and that, that's, that's where recruiters mostly too often worship the vacancy. So they only do BD until they pick up a job and then they can go, ah, oh, now I can just source. Life is good. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. I'm sourcing today. I'm sh I'm shortlisting. Yeah, I'm nurturing today. I'm talking to the client today. You know where the best the best BD people know that that basically as soon as you've got the job, it's about minimising the amount of effort and energy in managing the placement process so you can get back out there and find another uh, find another vacancy. Uh, what what always amuses me as soon as someone picks up the job, they're probably on fire. They've probably got the most momentum that they've got. So the next thing they do is stop doing what was working. It's like they've just got up to top speed on the bike and they top ped stop pedaling. Yeah. Like uh, and uh, where the best people I know go, like just they, they picked up a job and they go, great, I'll do with that in an hour's time. Let me make some more calls because I'm on a streak. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling lucky. Uh, 
So there's, there, there's loads and loads of stuff being written recently in the business dev side of stuff and recruitment and sales in general about smiling and dialing and it's it's dead, it's all this, it's all that. Um, do you have any uh, specific KPIs around business development for the teams that you're coaching and working with? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason people like saying the phone is dead is because it's really trendy. Uh, and it's trendy because everyone loves to find an excuse that they don't have to pick up the phone. Uh, and, and and just at a, a very simple level, if you just look at like, how the how the communication works is that when was the last time a client sent you an email of 180 words? Hmm. No, they don't. OK, but in a minute's conversation, you will. If the client talks to you for a minute, you get 180 words of conversation. Five minute conversation, you're going to get 900 words. And that's just not my words. The BBC say three words a second is, is what, what, how people talk. Yeah. Uh, and so and so you think and that's why face to face is so good. You have an hour long meeting. You've got 60 times 180. You're like in, you're, you could write a book <laughs> just from, 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 from that meeting. And it's got context as well. So I think the thing is with business develop phone activity is about making sure that it's of value. And so I, I probably had this debate quality versus quantity with my manager probably every week for about three years when I first started. And it was always like, so what do you want? Loads of volume, but low quality, or do you want quantity, but low, low quantity? And the answer was always both. You know, it's easy to do, it's easy to do high volumes that are shit, that's shit. Uh, yeah. It's easy to make three calls a week that are amazing. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you speak to three people, you're not putting enough in the machine to let to let some of the law of averages take care of themselves. And and I, I think uh, some of you will be familiar with something called zero moment of trust, which is something Google talked about, which is how people's decision making and buying process is changing because of the Internet. And, and Dave Herzlhurst introduced me to the to the idea. And and, and one that what Google does is because it's a digital company, it talks about blogs, videos, social media referrals, social networks. But you know what? The phone is a great way to, 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 to promote yourself. To, so at the moment of truth, yeah. uh, that, that, that you're, you're considered in that. And, and so uh, the key is, is that don't see business development calling as a sales call, see it as a marketing call. Because all you're really doing is saying, look, hi, it's me. Uh, I understand a little bit about you. Here's a bit of value. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and just, just you know, I'm here, <laughs> yeah, and that, that's all a BD call is. And, and and when I've been training BD recently, I work with a lot of teams that love delivery, hate BD. And when you put it like that, everyone starts getting excited about business development because suddenly all they are is a phone call is just a TV advert. It's just it's just a, it's a pop up. Yeah, it's just going hi, oh, here's value. So on on that, just before we go on to the next, I just want to take Cassia's question of that's all right. So she's coming in there and actually asking, does it make sense to separate BD and delivery then? Would it seem easier to build credibility if it's the same people doing both? Great question. Mm. Uh, it, is a good, it is a good question. I think uh, if you've got someone that's great at BD, it makes sense to build a delivery team below them. Uh, if you think about other professional services firms, you take an audit partner that's a rainmaker. They can have 30 people underneath them delivering that service. Yep. Uh, recruitment specializes in rainmakers supporting one person and one person only, which is the rainmaker. Because hmm. the, the irony is in most recruitment firms, the best business developers do the least business development because they ran hard for two years, won a few clients, got given a couple, and now they can sit, sit there and sort of milk the cow of their existing clients yep. and just sort of just sort of like make just make hay. Uh, mm -hmm. And then so they give the most hardest part of the job to the people that know absolutely nothing, are the least prepared to represent the business. Uh, and so good businesses are working out a way to have a delivery model. And in some ways, that's the birth of a lot of RPOs, which is, you know what, mm -hmm. I'm a good rainmaker. I'll go out and I'll say, give me all your roles and I'll go and deliver them for you. And you look at people like uh, Randstad, Source, Source Direct, and you look at uh, Experis. You know, they just have people going out and winning loads of vacancies and then they have delivery teams and they make they make pretty good money from that. Yeah. Uh, so so in an ideal world, to answer Casey's uh, question is that you if you can have a rainmaker that's bringing in enough vacancies and they've got people supporting them with delivery and delivery is not just sourcing, but it's also evolving to manage some of the client relationship and managing the vacancy process. You can build quite a big business on the back of that. Uh -huh. uh, the challenge is, is that most recruiters only do BD to the point where they can sit there and earn top dollar just for milking the cow, uh, where uh, because that's sort of what the model is. Yeah. Where it takes a special person to still be excited about BD after four or five years. 
mm-hmm. when they could just earn the same amount of money just just milking the cow until it dies and waiting for someone to leave and getting given another client yeah that's a pretty good answer alex uh, i'm just going to kind of like pick it on from there and uh, i guess there's a few, probably a few more questions coming in which we can we can pick up in a second but i wanted to pick up just on the thing that you mentioned to say like it's not as daunting making a call if it's not a sales call it's a marketing call so if you just if i just kind of like put my kind of sort of black hat uh sort of like uh maybe like old school sort of head on here and say like okay uh and say sit down with cammy and say so cammy how many uh so you made uh you made 200 calls this week that's pretty good so uh how many jobs did you get on from that and cammy says well i didn't get any jobs on from that because i wasn't i wasn't out there trying to make sales you know i was just out there trying to spread the word increase the brand i was trying to make marketing calls so i i've made a tv advert into 200 of those top accounts that that's pretty awesome isn't it um so how would you i mean how would you counter that like well, I mean, is I think, that like a, a change in expectations change in the business model different kpis well i think the, the the thing is is that it's what you're expecting out of it so too many recruit businesses just judge the output as a vacancy so what so the next step back from that <clears> is leads <throat> so who did you find out that has a contractor on site today uh, that you need to talk to more of because a lot of times when you're making these adverts you're also qualifying as someone whether they're going to do business whether you actually want to call them again you, to your point mm-hmm. am i going to get paid for this marketing activity you don't market and advertise to people that are never going to buy what you're selling uh so a so right at the top of the funnel how many people did you speak to that are able to buy from you so mm-hmm. and that means that don't have a psl <laughs> or they cheat on their current psl uh then you sort of talk about how many people did you speak to for the second or third time and what did you learn about what's going on in that business that might cause change because change generally equals recruitment and then the third thing is who did you speak to that might have something going on that's going to lead to a vacancy in the next 30 60 90 days and so when it when it comes to reviewing calls what you're doing is what information have you got out that enables you to make better calls the next time uh yeah. and then your sales calls the sales calls that you do make are calling people that you know are going to recruit in the next 30 days which is give me a chance i can help you and that's where you become more focused on an output uh because you know there's something to fight for where i mean if i ring up you and i go hi alan how you doing great i know you've got a big team there i know you're growing do you want to recruit do you want to recruit like you're going to be like get lost i'm not recruiting but if I, but 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 if if I know that I just saw I just saw Cam CV on a job board, uh, I didn't by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but you know, I'd bring up, I'd be like I'd be like Mark. I'd be a bit more direct marketing. I'm going, Alan, just just out of interest, what would you do if someone left? How would you approach that? What profile could I spec to you? Uh, and then I see Cam's resigned, and then I'm like, Alan, look, I told you I've got good people. Please give me a chance. What would I have to do to get a chance? You know, and at that point, when I know you've got a need, that's when you have the license to be a bit more influential because actually there's some there's a there's a commitment to be had when more often than not anyone can say yeah i'll give you the next job and they're lying they just want to get you off the phone mm-hmm. i'm not sure if that answers your question on the 200 bd calls yeah, yeah i mean it's just like i think what you're saying though is like just think about it differently in terms of like you're going to do some market research effectively so a lot of those calls and rather than just be like i've got a phone I've got a hundred names. I'm going out there to call them and get like three converted or five converted or 10 or 20 or whatever your conversion ratio is. I'm actually just going to go out there. I'm just going to build market intelligence so that when the next time that I come back, rather than start with a list of hundred and convert three, I'm going to start with a list of 20 and convert five. Yeah. I think that's what you're going to say. Yeah. And so I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a traditional funnel. So, yeah. uh, and what you're doing is so some days I might be on the, let's sort the <clears> wheat from the chaff. Uh-huh. You know, and that's literally a hi do you, do you have a psl yes no you know and, and that's that sort of market research i'm going to add some value but really i'm not expecting much yeah but then i've got another list of uh i've got another list of people that i have spoken to that i know do buy what i'm selling are able to buy from me uh and you all have the, every, every business developer will have those lists where you know they're they've, they've thought about their crm you know yeah. and you'll have a list of those customers and you know that marketing call is is more focused more focused on you promote you don't promote new functionality to someone you spoke to the first time, but you've got a group of people where you highlight upgrades and you highlight new functionality and you go, oh, you know, you mentioned this. We're now doing that because you're just sort of saying, hi, I'm here. And when you when you do that, we're going to have what you want. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's a different type of call. And the goal 
the where volume comes in is that you need to work through that wheat from the chaff to to be able to have that pool of I call it the three hundred, mm-hmm. which is three hundred managers that are that are qualified. Uh, like I, I, we, I, I sort of call three hundred and sixty recruitment Spartan recruitment. So you got it's all about the three hundred, uh, and so you're gonna have your three hundred managers, and and you uh, and and you, those those are the people that you know could buy from you or able to buy from you, and you nurture those relationships. Yeah. Uh, mm. But if you don't, put, I mean, I'm not sure if you know how they mine open cast diamond mining. They start just by blasting a hose into the hillside and washing away all the mud. That takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. Yeah. Then they put the rocks on a belt and they sort the rocks between a rock that could have a diamond and a rock that won't have a diamond because you can tell. And then they put it into a processing plant where they try to find the diamonds in the rocks that typically have diamonds in. And that's all we're doing in business development. But you've got to you've got to blast away the hillside. And that's where social media can help. That's where lead gen activity can help. Yeah. Uh, but, but for most recruiters, the quickest way to do that is by picking up the phone and taking references, calling people where, you know, they've worked in the past. Uh, tracking where you know there's contractors on site at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you, so you basically, so your advice to Cami is get a big shield like a Spartan. If it's okay, <laughs> this week he's just using his hose to blast away some of the muck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is this is hose, this is sort of like hose, this is hose blasting. But Cameron, do you have do you have, so for you, do you how many how many qualified managers do you have in your target list? Uh, People that you've spoken to that you know they've got a CRM and you know they've got something in the next year to 18 months that something might cause them to change the CRM. Yeah, we've got a few, I mean, a few hundred. I mean, we're, we're working to a very similar sort of process that you would use there. You know, we're capturing the initial information that we know that we then have a, a need and a, and a want to have a follow-up call with them at a particular trigger point in their, in their cycle. We are ready to go back and add more value to the conversation at that moment in time. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, the thing is, I'm not a messiah for, for, <laughs> for, for business development. I mean, this is really standard stuff the problem is is most recruiters come from a delivery environment rather than a business development environment and so that's where a lot of leaders struggle is because they, they drive it based on working vacancies rather than mm. a, and, and and it's not helped by a lot of crms with all due respect it's yeah. that no most crms aren't very good at managing sales mm. processes and sales relationships so- uh just to say, do you think that the, the change on that then needs to come from the come from the top down as well? Because a lot of people find themselves in senior roles in recruitment because they've been top billers. But when they get to that, it's like we'll do the same what we've always done. Do you think the change needs to filter from top down a little bit? I think I think that it, it all comes from the leadership. I think the problem that most medium sized recruitment companies have is that by the time they own or run the business is they want to treat their people like they would have been treated, not like they were treated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they go, Oh, I hated KPIs. I won't use KPIs. I never gave, I hated being given a hard time about activity. So I won't give everyone a hard time about activity mm-hmm. and then they don't succeed. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and when you say to them, right, okay, so, so just out of interest, uh, if you were to start a business today, what would you do? And they'll write down their formula and you go, great. And why do you know that? Oh, right. Cause that's what I was taught to do in my old business. And, how often did your manager talk to you about that's what you needed to do? Oh, regularly. And what happened if you didn't do it? Well, I got given a hard time. And what happened from that? Uh, well, I learned that if I didn't do it, I wasn't going to be successful. Right. OK, but you're happy to spend £3,000 every month. And that formula for success just stays in your head. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's sort of like and that's where you, you, you see a lot of the firms that really grow is that they grew up in what I call like a recruitment farm. So like a Robert Half or an S3 is a, is a great recruitment farm and they, they drive a process, you know, and they, they breed recruiters. Yeah. Uh, but yet they don't apply those same principles and, and, and work in a probably a more uh, a more sophisticated way to develop the same behaviors in their own stuff. Yeah. I mean, what 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 we're seeing, like in this in the software side, not just CRM, but like people are people nowadays are of the opinion where it's good to share knowledge. If you find something that works in a, in a in the era that we're in, where it's like an inbound era, digital marketing, blogging, etc., everyone shares things that work for them. But recruitment still feels very very interesting. Like it's like if you've got the golden nugget, then I'm not telling anyone else about it because no one out there is doing it. So it's like we're going to hang on to all our secrets. Whereas like, we're working in an environment where lots of people like to share what they're doing, and but it just yeah. seems that no one does that in recruitment. Or, or and that's wrong for me to say that. Not it's not that no one does it, but less and less people are. Doing. I think the the, the, the challenge for because I I, I I I I talk to marketing people all the time, and they're like, what, "What are you going to do to bring people together?" And the problem is, is a most recruiters 
don't haven't really any interest in speaking to other recruiters because <laughs> they want to put all their energy in speaking to the people that they want to recruit with. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so if I had to go to one business development event and will I go to hang out with other recruiters? Yeah. Uh, where my manager won't encourage me to go because I'm probably going to get recruited. Uh, or will I go and hang out with the chartered accountant group or a .NET development group? Mm -hmm. And and so really you you exist in your vertical in your niche because you're paid to get to know you you're paid to be in the hub of someone else's network yeah rather than your own network and so learning and development is quite difficult for recruiters if they don't take ownership for themselves because they, they hang out in the community that they recruit for not necessarily the community that they live in where in marketing uh in marketing people hang out in the marketing community and it's all like let's show seo ideas and yeah. And you can follow all those all, all those things. Same for accountants, same for lawyers. Uh, but in, in sales in general, I'd, I'd say most people are paid to hang out with the people that are going to buy their product. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so the only people that really want to hang out with recruiters are Re <laughs> Rector X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it's, really diff it's really difficult. And I, I, if someone's got a formula for how to... How to get loads of recruiters in one place that are excited about sharing best practice and ideas then then then, then probably let us all know so yeah yeah what, over to you mate sorry i cut you off there <laughs> cut you off there sorry <laughs> we're speaking you, you, through you, a virtual need, you need a tv studio where you can sort of pan between cameras that's what we need that's what we need come in yeah that's next that's next so if we just get back to the kind of specifics on business development because i think like that that's the kind of core bit that we really want to get into is the kind of the grit of like the the day-to-day -day of it um <clears throat> when you're approaching a new business uh we talked you talked about like things coming from the top down in terms of change but in terms of business development okay so i've got my 300 accounts that i'm targeting and i want to get to the right people should i start at the top I mean, who are who are the right should I start at the bottom? Who are the right people to start with in that account in terms of penetrating into it? Bro broadly speaking, you want to, where possible, start with the people that are going to buy what you're selling. So uh, ideally, you start with the manager of the candidates that you recruit for. So whenever I looked at a CV and, and my, my, if I was to start any recruitment desk, the first thing I would do is get on a job board, look at the candidates that put their CVs online in the last week and you can find and then call them and find out the name of their managers. You know, all those people are going to be recruiting in the next 90 days. Uh, <laughs> okay. Like, it's sort of like, it's, 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 you just, you want to do that. Now, what, what I might do, depending on how much you want to, I'd probably speak to a candidate that works in that business first to find out a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd call the line manager. And actually, sometimes starting lower is better as long as you don't expect to get anywhere because the lower the level, the more likely they are to be unwilling to break the PSL. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you'll find is by working at the lower level, you'll find out more about what is the existing recruitment process, a little bit more about what the business is. They might even give you an org chart. And as you move up, you approach the call going, well, I understand you're already doing this. I understand you're already doing that. You know, and they go, well, how did you do that? I know that. Well, I just know a lot of people in the market. And, <laughs> and by the time you get to the top guy, you're like, well, I understand this is your strategy and this is how you've approached it. And this is the challenge you've got. And they're like, wow, this guy's done loads of prep. But the prep is in all the other calls that you you, you you do uh so, that, that, so, so go yeah. ahead so you're saying like in terms of your approach it's bottom up and it's following on from what you said earlier which is like you know understand the market understand the internal market within the organization use the data build on it build on it build on it until you can you know eventually get to the decision maker yeah and and, and the decision maker mm -hmm. might come about sooner than later but especially mm -hmm. when for recruiters, you run up. The, the, what you think about recruitment processes is that recruitment processes can be broken at or above the level that they're signed at. Mm -hmm. So, so say for example, if I'm first line manager and the CFO signed the PSL, then mm -hmm. I'm unlikely to have the authorization to break it. Yeah. Say for example, if Cam's first line manager and Alan's the C CFO, uh, Cam, you 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 have the ability to occasionally break it because you can go. Alan, look, if I don't get this skill set, I'm yeah. not going to hit target. And Alan's yeah. going to go, oh, this is going to cost me. HR is going to kill me. But go on. Yeah. You know, you can do it. But make sure next time it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and Alan can just go, I'm doing whatever <laughs> I want. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and so, so the, the key with starting at the bottom up is you try and work out where whatever process they've got at the moment yeah. was signed. And yeah. then you can go outside it. And that's why 
getting around an RPO is so challenging because it's signed at an executive board level. Effectively, uh, they have outsourced responsibility. So it's you're almost wasting uh, you're, wasting, yeah. you're wasting your time. But an internal recruitment team isn't, isn't a no. It's just uh, not always. So, uh, and that's where you've got to work out where the, where the situations are that they might do that. Would you ever go top down? Uh, okay. If I had an, if I had a recommendation or a referral, or I'd done business with a peer, I might. Okay. Uh, or, if, or if that's the person that's actually recruiting, I would. So mm-hmm. if it's the C, I, if I, if the CEO was recruiting for a CFO, I'll just call the CEO. Yeah. Uh, I might call the CFO and find out what's going on, but but I would just I would just call the CEO. So you, I mean, it, more more than anything, most recruiters are chasing leads. Yeah. Uh, and so you're going to call the person that you think is going to be able to to do to do business with you. I think what what is working more now is that people are able to leverage their if you have got a real linkedin network and what i mean by that is you know everyone on there mm-hmm. uh, then you can look for connections on linkedin in and think right i actually know him and i know he knows him so you can reach out and go could you do an introduction and, and sometimes you will you, you will get that and more people are trying that and that that is working it's probably more on the candidate introduction side than the client side but uh that, but, but you go straight for the person that's going to write the check i guess that actually leads on to my next question. Like so far, we spoke a lot about business dev on the on the client side, but the best and the sharpest recruiters that I know focus on nurturing relationships on the candidate side and talent pooling for the long term. So that when they have a job on, they have existing relationships with candidates that are go to people for them as well. Um, but do you think that focusing on nurturing your relationships with passive candidates is is worthwhile? Uh, it, you know, it, it all depends on on how tight your niche is. So if you've got a tight niche in a tight geographical area, and therefore you're going to get jobs for the people in that talent pool, then it's worthwhile. So mm. well, why do why do shops keep stock? Well, because they know people are going to come in and buy it. Yeah. You know, and you don't you don't fill your shop full of stock that no one's going to buy. Yeah. You know, and 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 that that's where that's where a lot of for me talent pooling and being a specialist is at the heart of what I feel good recruitment is because. I just think it's difficult to do it otherwise and, and feel good about it and add value and therefore passive candidate recruiting becomes beneficial. And also it, you can get paid more than once for a single bit of sourcing effort. So every yeah. candidate I generate today for your job will be, I will get other jobs tomorrow that I can place those candidates I source for your jobs. And what you're doing is you're just moving people about, you get yeah. a candidate register, you've got two jobs for them. Yeah. Uh, where you're doing, I mean, too many recruiters are doing search and selection recruitment all over the UK and never able to reuse that sourcing effort. And then when you're doing it at 15% and your fill ratio is 20%, Mm -hmm. everyone's surprised when people only make six or seven grand a month. Yeah. And no no one gets rich off that. Mm -hmm. So the most successful recruiters are the ones that are able to move the market and and, and know where they where they are. And and it's finding that niche that that people are excited about. Also, I mean, to to answer your question, uh, it always amazes me, why wouldn't you nurture a relationship with a candidate if someone said to you that line manager is going to have a job in the next year uh they will be able to give you ten thousand pounds would you keep in touch with that person yes well absolutely (laughs) well 50 percent of the people that you probably speak to in the next year will seriously consider about moving so why wouldn't you nurture the relationship yeah so on one we've got one part of the market where we're taking people for drinks nurturing and wooing them on the other hand we're sort of walking up to them on the dance floor headbutting them and then trying to drag them off yeah Uh, and, and 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 we're surprised that people think we're bad people. Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's sort of, it's just mad. Yeah, I personally think that sometimes the nurturing, the, the relationship nurturing and the candidate side is often neglected. It's all about the clients. Yeah, if you can build good, solid talent pools and if, when you when you do get a job on, you've got a pool of people you can go to straight away and they know you, they, they're warm to you as an individual and as a brand that you've got behind you, it's far, far easier conversations to have. Yeah. have. And, and I think it's in the past where recruiting was more physical in its relationship, it was easier to have talent pools because the nature of how recruitment work needed you to do that. Mm-hmm. I think it is harder for recruiters to have talent pools because they're forced to maybe work a broader range of roles yeah. or a broader geographical area. So, uh, sorry, on you go. Sorry. No, no. So I was just saying it, it can be more difficult, uh, but it's not. And I think what most I see good recruiters do is they sort of have a tiered approach. They have their core one skill sets where they're actively talent pooling. They have their core two skill sets, which is if they see someone, they'll grab them and keep them and nurture mm-hmm. them. And then they've got their core three skill sets, which they will recruit for, but they're not going to ever probably keep in touch with those people because it's a it's a reactive job. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, you, you mentioned there that with the with it being less face to face, that's harder to do. But have you found having a good social brand behind you and being visible across multiple channels has made your job easier? Uh, yeah, and 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 what I do, I mean, I, I guess social media has really been a growth for me during the uh, when I haven't been working a desk. Mm. Uh, so for me, it's my it's a primary marketing vehicle for me, and and mm -hmm. blogging and doing things like this and videoing is absolutely key for people to to believe in in you but but even where i, I lived before uh on the farm uh you know we we, had, we did a lot of content marketing regular salary surveys events uh i would run webinars for for different professional associations and 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 that sort of focus on adding that giving business developers something to talk to their customers about that isn't just uh that isn't just a, a, a vacancy is, is, yeah. is part of what a business's marketing plan should be. You think about your event in Glasgow, it got gave you an opportunity to speak to loads of people to not say, do you want to talk about a CRM? But actually, would you like to come to our event? Yeah. But the implied thing is, by the way, this is everyone sort of knows what we do. Yeah. And, and, and I think when you think about BD phone calls as marketing, owners of businesses have more responsibility to give things to their consultants to make them excited about getting on the phone. Yeah. Uh, I would organize my own events. Uh, I remember when I first started uh, and I started in a market which is Swindon and I did temp accountants in Swindon up to 15 pounds an hour. That was my niche. Uh, and I phoned the local MP up and went, if I can get 20 business leaders in a room, would you come and talk to them? And she was like, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so I, I created my own event you know, yeah. and, and, and got 15 FDs in a room to talk to the local MP and facilitated a discussion and that was part of me having things to talk about. I got in the newspaper and, and that type yeah. of thing. So, uh, and that, that's old school because it's physical, but it's not to say that there's not similar things that you can do around webinars and value yeah. add, value add content. Yeah. So kind of last question for me, uh, Alex on, on this point is like, okay. I think, I think you're saying like social is valuable, but like really like you're speaking to a lot of people, in a lot of different recruitment businesses, some people were very, very advanced in terms of content marketing strategy and things. Some of the companies you name check there, but really, like, what's the split like? I mean, is is the majority of stuff really still coming from word of mouth? You know, in terms of referrals, candidates, and clients, or 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 is like this stuff, this social stuff, this digital marketing? You know, are you, are people actually seeing a return from that? Do you value? The thing is, is that. I think there is some people that are getting returns from it and you can sort of speak to people like Steve Ward and he'll say he's never made a sales call in his life. Uh, that's because he made a lot of marketing calls. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but I think the, the challenge with social media and digital is that it's still hard. It's still very reactive. It's still relying on someone. It's being there at the moment of truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and putting yourself in that position and too often you've got to you've got to nurture that and push it yourself and so i think where where people are on the phone and they are trying to add value to clients and nurturing existing clients because remember it's not just about uh the winning new clients it's about looking after the ones that you've got mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. that's where they get that's where they get the growth from because you're looking at three to six months to convert someone from a first call that isn't recruiting today between them actually maybe needing you for the first time now yeah uh, but but at the end of the day you've got to think about how do you feel in control? Uh, how do you feel like you have some sort of ownership of where your business is coming from? And that, that typically will come from physical re relationships that you've had either over the phone or face-to-face. Or, or -face. And, and digital really is the top end of that funnel. It reduces the need for you to do as much yeah. sort of sorting the wheat from the chaff. But it's about right. when that lead comes in, what, what, what are you then doing with it? And that's where the blend of recruitment marketing and sort of high volumes of phone activity are important. And, and I, I definitely see that I don't do a huge amount of just, hi, it's me, mm -hmm. but I do get leads come in through what I do. And yeah. uh, I, I, I just not organized enough with it. And that's the problem is you need to be really organized. You need to do a lot of it regularly mm -hmm. and consistently for people to believe in it. And that's where, whether you do a blab, whether you do a blog, whether you do thought leadership, yeah. It needs to be on a cycle where people begin to expect it. Good. I actually got a good question, good question from Tim there as well. So do you think clients want to get on recruiters' webinars? And it says, I suppose it depends on the content. How would you approach that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is you've got to think about what, what value are you going to bring to the client? So what would clients be interested in? Well, if you're looking to build relationships with internal recruiters and HR, you might get someone to talk about employer value proposition. 
mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. how to manage an inter- how, how to manage the counter how to prevent counter offers from people that you recruit for yeah uh, I, I've done I used to do regular webinars and on-site training for line managers on how to recruit so how to sell the dream how to interview yeah. just using simple techniques like staff techniques so if you're willing to add value and help them be better at what they do yeah uh, then then you can then, then then I think people are interested in that and and I know also in the businesses that run webinars and physical round tables or peer networking groups around industry topics because uh who was a guy there was a guy called tony babb uh okay. from harrington star at the uk recruiter event and he he now effectively runs industry events uh-huh. for his industry group yeah as a separate business from recruitment but it used to start as him actually just giving himself and some of his recruiters something to talk about uh, yeah, I, I like what you're saying there, um, Alex, because because it's actually it follows on from what you're talking about earlier. So it's about having a different objective with that, really, isn't it? It's like if you're setting out to do a webinar to say, "Hey, I'm going to give you a webinar, like a sales focused webinar on why you should buy my services, why you should recruit with me," then you're probably not going to get a lot of attendees there. But if you're saying, "Well, like here's a hot topic in our industry." I'm going to get some really credible person on here to talk to you about that. Um, and then you're probably going to pull like quite a big network and then that network, you can market that network that fills the top of your funnel. Yeah. And I mean, you look at just even, I mean, you guys are, are great. So you've run an event, you you have a podcast, which you full of industry leaders, which I've been on once. <laughs> uh, you've, got, you've, got, you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got blabs. But you're, but you're trying to add value. I've read your blogs on managing work in progress. You know, everything you write is about helping me as, as, a, as, a, as a leader of a recruitment business. And that's you giving back. You know, that's you going, look, I want to help you. I want to help you do what you do. I want to help you under, overcome your problems. But you're also saying, look, I understand you, mm-hmm. which gives credibility, but also builds trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at my blogs, most of my blogs are, here's a problem you're going to encounter. Here's a way you could handle it. Uh-huh. It's it's all got to be about giving, you know. And if you if you serve first, then generally then then clients come second. Yeah. Uh, and and but they come for the long time as well. Uh, I think Greg said recently is that if you want to compete on speed and price, it's a it's a quick way to go out of business. Yeah. And 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 so it because technology can do that, and and there's always going to be someone that does it cheaper. Yeah. I'm all about finding a niche, being committed to being a premium a premium offering. Yeah. Uh, Brilliant. And Alex, um, last question. I always tend to sign off on the blab, blab with this question, seeing as it's called the future of recruitment. Um, in your opinion, what does the future of recruitment look like? Uh, varied. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think the pie will grow, but the delivery models will continue to expand. And I think uh, internal recruitment will evolve. I think the ability for technology to manage a whole recruitment process, uh, especially in temp where there's more transactional where skill is more about the body. So you can already see from people like people by the hour, Fiverr yeah. on the London tube at the moment, there's someone that does catering and, and hospitality recruitment just through an app. Mm-hmm. And there's people going, oh, I got a job in 20. I mean, if you want a waiter, they're a waiter, you know, yeah. like if I was a catering recruiter, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be worried. Yeah. Uh, the, the trick is, is will a catering recruiter create their own app to, to dominate that? So, I think it's just going to look more varied. And I think it, people, there'll be forms of recruitment that are really just sourcing, which serve the RPOs, which are effectively outsource sourcing functions. Yeah. And then, and then true contingent recruitment will probably stay the same size, but have to become more specialist or exist in specialisms that are non-commoditized and are new and where there's a shortage of demand. Uh, uh, and, and every, every skill set goes through a sort of a massive, de- so, no demand, no supply, massive demand, no supply, massive demand, no supply, it's good supply and demand, loads of supply, very little demand. Yeah. And so .NET's a good example of that. <coughs> so months ago, massive demand, low supply. Now, two years later, there's enough people with two years .NET experience where now it's at an equilibrium. So it's still a good market, probably the sweet spot. And then in two years time, it will be a commoditized where you can get .NET people wherever you want. Uh, and, and then therefore it will be harder for a contingent recruiter to work it because an in-house or a fixed price recruiter can find the candidates themselves. Mm. So it'll just look more varied. It'll be more niches and people will have to look at the specific area where they make money. 
Great, brilliant. Alex, where can people get in touch with you if they want to give you a, give you a shout? Uh, I sort of hang out on elevatedrecruiting.com. Uh, I'm just about to post a, a free link to a, 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 a ebook that I did, which is helping companies with business development culture. So you're welcome to uh, you're welcome to download that, and that might give you some ideas and some things that you can do within your own business uh, that helps you just just hit some of the easy things to do. Uh, I'm getting lots of uh, queries about business development at the moment. People seeing maybe uncertain times, eight yeah. a year ahead. Yeah, that BD is going to be the thing that gets you through. So uh, I'm getting a lot of demand for that at the moment. So just that might might help. And just track me down on LinkedIn or Twitter. There's only one Alex Moyle, I think, on LinkedIn. So uh, or only one in recruitment, anyway. So <laughs> uh, but it's been good. Fantastic, Alex. Cool. Thanks very much for taking the time out to join us today. And um, thanks to everyone uh, coming in to watch as well. As always, really, really appreciated. Thanks very much. Yeah, there were some great comments from uh, from the from the stream as well. So yeah. thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See, See you soon. Later. Cheers. Bye. Bye, 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 Tim. Cheers. Bye, everyone.